right, good morning everyone and welcome to our March Extension Master Gardener webinar. Uh, before we get started this morning, please note that the recording for today's session will be posted to our online Extension Master Gardener webinar archive and I will post that link in the chat box in just a minute. If you have any questions for our speaker, please type those into the chat box and we're going to get to as many of those at the end of the session as we can. Um, without further ado, I am very excited to welcome our speaker this morning, uh, Josh Cardos. Dr. Cardos is an instructor with the Virginia Tech School of Plant and Environmental Sciences, um, and he has expertise in plant propagation, production horticulture, and plant materials. Um, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, so believe it or not, I would so much rather be in person instead of uh, looking at this screen, but this is where we are. And obviously this is the best way to have a lot of people from um, all over, possibly all over the state uh, attending and listening in. So um, yeah, as Kathleen said, I'm an instructor here at Virginia Tech. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just getting feedback. I don't know if somebody's maybe not muted and I'm getting some feedback, but uh, anyway, I'm an instructor here at Virginia Tech. Uh, the, the long of it is the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences. Um, I tend to go with, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm an instructor in horticulture, but I can't really say that anymore because there's not specifically a horticulture department or under the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences. Um, I teach uh, five different classes here. Uh, that includes uh, indoor plants, plant propagation, herbaceous landscape plants, uh, greenhouse management, and ornamental plant production and marketing. And I'm also developing two new courses on uh, controlled environment agriculture. Uh, previously, for the previous four years before coming to Virginia Tech, I worked um, in North Carolina and helped manage a startup internationally owned vegetable grafting operation. So I have quite a bit of experience in vegetable grafting. Uh, it was owned by a, a, um, an Italian company, an Israeli company, and an American company. So I spent quite a lot of time in Italy and Israel uh, visiting their nurseries and learning more about grafting and applying it in our operations. So um, our topic today is obviously vegetable grafting. And like most of horticulture, it involves both an art and a science. As Dr. Michael Durr, I hope, I hope you guys know who Dr. Michael Durr is. I ask my students this and it's just devastating when like no one in the room knows who Mike Durr is. So hopefully you guys know who he is. Uh, but he was one of my mentors, one of my former professors. And he always said, uh, plants don't read the books. And so um, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to attempt to give you an overview of vegetable grafting understanding as we'll come back to plants don't read the books. So it's not always easy. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach it, but we'll talk through some of that. Uh, I have included a link at the end of my talk to a video, it's a YouTube video uh, that I filmed last spring for my plant propagation class. Um, actually vegetable grafting was, would have been the next lab that we would have conducted after spring break, but, as you guys are all aware, um, it was roughly this time last year when uh, COVID shut down Virginia Tech. And uh, so the students couldn't come back from spring break. So instead of them coming and grafting vegetables, I had all the plants in the greenhouse ready to go. I had to do it myself and video that and share it with them. So um, I have included a link to that at the end. Uh, that you were welcome to watch. I originally was going to approach this by talking maybe 20 minutes and then showing you it's a 21 minute video, but I felt that um, you can also watch other crafting videos on YouTube. And uh, so it's not the only one out there. And I thought there might be more value in going more in depth into grafting. And then you can watch that video on your own time if you choose. So uh, in two weeks, my, plant, my current plant propagation class is going to be crafting vegetables here at Virginia Tech. So when I say vegetable grafting, um, most of this talk is going to focus on tomatoes and watermelons. And I realize those are uh, technically fruits, but we consider them vegetables when it comes to the horticulture industry and how we approach these, uh, these things specifically in crafting. So let's see if my slide, there we go. 
Okay, so to be successful at grafting, it's important that we start with the basics. So we do need to lay some groundwork before we can really get into uh, more detail on grafting. So I've already said uh, horticulture and grafting um, are both an art and a science. And so like nearly any topic, there's a plethora of information out there on vegetable grafting. All you have to do is Google it and you will find loads of information. Um, now be aware, some of it is good, uh, some of it is bad, and some of it honestly is just personal preference. And so it's difficult sometimes to kind of navigate through that to sort out the good from the bad. So um, I wanna preface my talk today and I'm gonna to try to do this. I can't promise you always will, but if there's something that I'm talking about that's more personal preference, I'm gonna to try to highlight that so that you don't leave here with this misunderstanding that what I'm saying is the only way to do that. There are certain things that it's very important that we follow, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. So um, I know you guys are all master gardeners. And so uh, hopefully none of you have ever found yourself in a situation like this goofy little cartoon here. Uh, 60 days in, Ron is concerned about the cutting he took from his friend's artificial plant. So I know none of you would do something like that. But um, the reason I include that is if you go into vegetable grafting uh, more or less blind with no information, um, it may feel like trying to root an artificial plant. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, so it's important that you have some basic information going into that. Okay, some of you already know what grafting is. Some of you, this is a new uh, term or concept, or you've heard it, but you're not really sure what it is. So we just wanna lay some groundwork here before we go into more detail. So when I say graft, uh, to graft or uh, referring to a plant as a graft, uh, grafting is joining the tissue of two plants together, and that continues to grow together as a single plant. Um, when we talk about grafting, we have uh, really two main parts to the grafted plant. Uh, we have the scion, which is the upper portion. Um, and this, this is a, a diagram of a grafted tomato. So we see the scion here at the top. And the scion is the part of the plant or the plant or the variety that has the desirable fruiting or flowering or foliage qualities or habit or some other characteristic that we're looking for. If it's an ornamental plant, this is the ornamental portion. Uh, if it's a plant like a, a tomato or a watermelon, this is the portion that is producing the type of fruit that we're looking for. Uh, the rootstock is this bottom portion. Uh, and the rootstock is a different plant. It's a different variety. It sometimes is a different species uh, that has desirable characteristics from the standpoint of things like soil-borne disease resistance, stress tolerances, whether this is to different types of soil or climatic conditions. Uh, oftentimes it's a more vigorous root system. So um, we'll talk about that and why that's important, but it is the lower portion of the grafted plant. And then we have the graft union, which is simply the junction or the area where these two parts, the scion and the rootstock are joined. Okay, so what is grafting? Uh, grafting is a form of vegetative or asexual propagation. So other types of vegetative or asexual propagation would be cuttings, stem cuttings, leaf cuttings, root cuttings, uh, division, layering, things like that. Uh, grafting is more difficult than propagation by seeds or cuttings. So I don't want to misrepresent it and say, oh, grafting is super easy. It is more difficult than, than seeds or cuttings, but it's something that you can absolutely do at home. Uh, grafting is used for nearly all production of apples, pears, peaches, grapes, and even greenhouse grown tomatoes. So if you're going into the grocery store this time of year <clears throat> and you're buying tomatoes, very likely they're produced in a greenhouse and more likely than not, they are grafted tomatoes. Uh, grafting is also thousands of years old. This is not a new technique. Uh, grafting was practiced in ancient China, Mesopotamia. It's mentioned in the Bible, so this is not a new concept, but the application of grafting to vegetables is relatively new. Um, I would say for several decades now, grafted tomatoes have been common in the U.S., uh, but when we talk about the grafted watermelons, uh, that's a relatively new thing, really like past decade in the U.S. Um, grafting is not the creation of a genetically modified organism or GMO. So we're not mixing DNA from two different plants. We're not creating this uh, you know, Frankenstein type plant. 
Uh, so it's not a GMO. It's not a hybrid. We're not breeding these plants. We're not, again, we're not mixing uh, DNA uh, or genetics from the two plants. We're just joining them together. Um, grafting is not a method for joining completely unrelated plants. So I always get the question, like, uh, can, you, can you graft a pine tree on an oak tree? No. Uh, can you graft a tomato on a watermelon? No. Uh, but there are some different types of plants that we can graft that we might not realize we can graft. We'll talk about that uh, shortly. Um, grafting is not useful for every type of plant. So not every type of plant lends itself to grafting. Um, for example, strawberries would not be a good plant to graft. Um, but it works for a lot of the vegetables that we, uh, we produce. And grafting is not really all that complicated. Well, sort of. Um, I'll, I'll explain that. Uh, there are some important things that we follow, and it is more difficult than propagation by seeds or cuttings, but it's not impossible to do at home. Okay, so why would we graft? Uh, well, today we're talking about vegetables, but just briefly, I want to mention with ornamentals and fruit trees, uh, ornamentals, primarily it's for aesthetics. So ornamentals, we could craft a weeping type of plant onto a standard. So we might have a tall trunk that we craft a weeping cherry, for example, onto um, for fruit trees. It's for disease resistance. It's for uh, soil tolerance. It's for um, dwarfing characteristics. So there's a lot of rootstocks in fruit trees that have a height reduction effect on the scion. Uh, so by grafting onto those rootstocks, we keep the overall plant height shorter, which makes harvest easier. Uh, but we're talking about vegetables. So why, do, why would we graft vegetables? Uh, well, we graft, one of the biggest reasons is disease resistance. And when I say disease resistance, I'm referring to soil-borne diseases. So uh, there's, there's research looking at whether or not grafting um, has any benefit for foliar disease resistance? And so far, it looks like the answer is no. Um, but if we're talking about diseases coming from the soil that would be taken up and that would infect the plant through the roots and it would be translocated up through the plant, uh, so things like late blight in tomatoes or fusarium wilt in watermelon, uh, those would be things that are in the soil. Uh, so grafting can help with that. It can provide disease resistance in those cases. Uh, grafting can also result in increased yield and extended harvest. So we can get more produce. We can harvest over a longer period of time. Uh, that partly relates to disease resistance because oftentimes uh, we plant things in our garden and they look great. And as the summer continues and maybe we have more rain, more humidity, uh, there's more disease pressure and we end up losing those plants. Um, they also, grafting provides more vigor. So I said that, uh, again, a more vigorous root system. So that can help to increase yield and extend harvest. We can use grafting, for example, uh, to make heirloom varieties more productive. So if anybody's grown any of the heirloom tomato varieties, they have a lot more flavor, uh, but generally they don't yield over as long a period of time. <clears throat> they're, they're not they weren't selected necessarily for disease resistance, more for their fruit qualities. And so we can graft those good fruit qualities onto a disease resistant bigger fruit stock. Uh, we can graft as a hobby. So um, I don't know if anybody's into growing like huge pumpkins for contests. There's actually a lot of people that graft uh, for that reason, because we can um, pr produce a more vigorous plant that's gonna help to grow a larger pumpkin. Um, you can graft also to sell transplants. So uh, if you are interested in grafting your own plants and you craft some extra, uh, typically in the past, um, I have grown transplants for my garden. So like in Georgia, uh, I had a, quite a large vegetable garden. I would always start a lot of different tomato seeds and I would always start more than I needed. I would plant the best in my garden and I would sell the rest. I'd sell them on Craigslist and I would end up recovering the cost of my seeds and my potting soil and all of that by selling the extras. So yeah, grafting could be the same way. You could uh, sell extra transplants. Um, there are benefits of grafting to organic production because if you, whether you run a certified organic farm or you're just producing your produce organically, you are limited in what pesticides you can apply. Uh, therefore, having this disease resistance, having a more vigorous plant can help um, in organic production. So 
Uh, roadside markets, pick your own operations, locally grown. Uh, grafting is very, very important. And a, there's different reasons for this, but one of the reasons is that typically, and this applies also to your, your own garden at home, most likely you're planting your garden in the same spot year after year. You know, you've established a vegetable garden plot. Now you may rotate within that. You may plant tomatoes on this side this year and swap them with the beans next year, but it's still gonna be within the same area. So again, you're more likely to build up soil-borne disease. <clears throat> the same thing for like a roadside market or a pick your own operation. Uh, they don't wanna rotate to other fields they want to have, you know, tomatoes that you can pick right there by the roadside stand. Um, there's, there's benefits, again, for greenhouse production because there's a lot invested in that greenhouse and they want to produce for a long period of time. But there's also these benefits in field, primarily of the disease resistance. What about ad adverse effects? Um, some people ask, well, you know, uh, if you're grafting, won't it affect the fruit in some negative way? Uh, there are occasional times where uh, there can be an adverse effect of making the, the fruit too firm, uh, but that's, that's only in rare cases. So if you think of watermelons, like the, the mini watermelons, little personal size melons, <clears throat> if we were to graft that onto a vigorous rootstock, it may make those really hard because the rootstock is so vigorous. But Otherwise, it doesn't really change the flavor of the grafted uh, produce. There, there aren't uh, really any adverse effects to this. Okay, so I mentioned um, like pumpkin growing contests. Uh, so one of the things you can do is you can grab multiple rootstocks onto a single scion. So you have more roots feeding into that plant to help make a larger plant. So that's one of the techniques uh, that people use to grow these large pumpkins. Um, one other just interesting thing uh, that I can't not mention. Uh, so some of you may know this, some of you may not. Uh, tomatoes and potatoes are both solanaceous plants. They're in the same family, nightshade family. <clears throat> so we can actually graft tomato onto potato. Uh, there, there's a company out of California that markets their grafted tomato potato transplants. I think they market it as ketchup and fries and the idea is that you grow this like in a large container on a patio, you're harvesting tomatoes throughout the summer and you can make your own ketchup. And at the end of the season, you can harvest potatoes out of the bottom and then you make French fries. I, I mean, this works okay. Like I'm not knocking it. Um, just think about the fact though that you have a plant that's trying to produce potatoes and tomatoes that's, that's fairly taxing on the plant. So you're probably not going to get a huge yield of either one. But uh, anyway, there's interesting reasons to graft. Again, maybe more hobby reasons than anything. Okay, so when we talk about grafting, I mentioned that we're focusing on tomatoes and watermelons, but when we look at uh, tomatoes, again, they're solanaceous plants, so they're related to peppers, to eggplant as well. We can graft those also, and we would graft those the same way as a tomato. Primary reasons are uh, resistance to soil-borne disease um, and increased crop yield. If we look at this group of plants called cucurbits, this would be things like watermelon, melons, so any of the honeydews or uh, cantaloupes, uh, pumpkins, gourds, squashes, cucumbers, these are all cucurbits. Uh, primarily, we're, we're grafting, again, for resistance to soil-borne diseases, increased crop yield, um, but, and then contests could kind of go into this sort of a home gardener um, reason for grafting. Uh, commercially, there's some reasons such as extended holding capacity, so we're able to keep the watermelons in the field longer, uh, they have firmer flesh, uh, they hold up longer, and if you've ever gone to the grocery store and bought the like mixed fruit container uh, that where they cut up there at the store, and it has watermelon, the watermelon tends to lose its juice, and there's a lot of watermelon juice in the bottom, so a grafted watermelon has firmer flesh and it holds that juice longer, so there's benefits uh, to grafting watermelons for commercial growers also. All right, so as far as sources of grafted vegetable transplants, I'm promoting that you graft yourself, or at least you try grafting yourself. Uh, if you try and fail, or you're like, okay, I'm gonna try this, but I'm really interested in 
having some grafted vegetable transplants. I'm not sure that I'm going to have success. So where could I buy some? Um, you can buy them online at a lot of different places. I've just listed a few. This is not an exhaustive list, but Chinese Selected Seeds, Territorial Seed Company, Jung Seed, Park Seed, uh, all have, um, I say they have, I mean, they may be sold out. So anybody that's uh, looked at like what's happened in the seed market and a lot of gardening supplies, if you're into uh, raising your own, your own animals, like uh, chickens or, or whatever, like we, so we have laying hens, we have pigs, we have goats, uh, we're hoping to get some cows. Um, a lot of times like chicken feeds running short, the electric, electric portable fencing for chickens, things like that, uh, oftentimes have been back ordered or sold out in this past year. So I'm not guaranteeing you these companies have plants still available, but these are places that sell them. Um, Banner Farms in North Carolina is a production greenhouse that sells, they really sell more commercially, uh, meaning larger quantities. So like you still, like you might be able to go in with several other people and buy a flat, like a whole tray of grafted plants is a possibility, but they're not gonna sell you five transplants. Uh, local garden centers. So I've actually seen in big box stores, so like Lowe's Home Depot, if you're in Blacksburg, <clears throat> I would hope you support uh, Crow's Nest Garden Center. But wherever you happen to be, uh, please support your local garden center. Uh, these places I have seen, not always, and not all of them, uh, carrying grafted vegetable transplants. So expect to pay anywhere between like three and a half dollars to ten dollars or more per plant if you're buying these. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely more expensive. And just be aware if you are ordering plants online, um, typically plants, when we, this is more geared to tomatoes, <clears throat> but usually plants are either uh, produced for the field, which would be in a, usually a peat-based media or more intended for greenhouse. So this is a rock wool media. Not that you can't use uh, these plants in the field or in the ground, um, but just be aware that if you are buying <clears throat> a greenhouse tomato transplants, uh, likely they're going to be in a rock wool media that dries out very quickly <clears throat> before the plant roots into the soil. Um, and they may be smaller. And the graft itself, we'll talk again about grafting the graft union, but you see that grafting clip on these, that graft may be much closer to the surface than what we would see in a tomato produced for the field where that graft is higher. And we'll come back to why that's important. So hopefully you at least try this yourself, but if you want to purchase some, here's some places you could look. Okay, so what is involved in grafting? Like how long does this take? What do you need to do? Uh, well, it's a four or five step process, depending on how you look at this, um, because we start with raising seedlings, starting seed. Um, and we have to, but we have to start the rootstock and the scion from seed. So these are two different plants. Uh, we are growing a specific variety for the rootstock and a specific variety for the scion. And because these don't always grow exactly the same, uh, and you need to time them together for grafting, I'm sort of saying it's a five step process because you're growing the rootstock, you're growing the scion. <clears throat> then when they are ready, you're grafting. You have to heal that graft. And then we have to harden off that transplant or finish that plant or acclimate that plant so that it's ready to go out into a garden setting. Now this usually takes around four to six weeks, uh, depending on uh, the species and the time of year. So different species can be a little faster than others, uh, time of year. So if you're grafting in spring or summer, it's gonna go faster than if you were grafting in the middle of winter. Uh, so here's a timeline that just lays some of that out, but we'll talk through each of these steps. All right, so I mentioned that you have different varieties of <clears throat> scion and rootstock. So how do you choose these varieties? Which, which varieties do you choose? Well, when it comes to the rootstock, um, if we, um, I'm not partial to Johnny selected seeds, I get nothing. This is not like those Amazon links, you know, where if you click on it, I get money. It's not like that at all. Uh, I just, I think Johnny's has a nice website. They give, they give good information. So <clears throat> they sell seed in quantities that make sense for a home gardener. Uh, <clears throat> you know, oftentimes they have seed starting uh, as a small packet instead of other places like, um, you know, maybe you have to buy 500 seeds or a thousand seeds. So 
If we talk about tomato, so I'm abbreviating tomato TM and then watermelon WM. So we talk about tomato, uh, you wanna choose a rootstock variety based on disease resistance and or vigor. So if you happen to be grafting tomatoes and growing them in a greenhouse environment, hydroponically, for example, you're not growing in the soil. Uh, so then you may be more interested in vigor and not so much in disease resistance, but I would figure that <clears throat> most of you would be planting your plants in the ground. So disease resistance is important. When you look at these uh, different varieties, so here are four, excuse me, five different varieties of tomato rootstock. Excuse me, this is uh, four different varieties because they have estamino as both regular seed and organic seed. So we have estamino maxifort, uh, DR0141TX, and Xinjiang Gang. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful. But if you look at each of these, if you click on them, they'll tell you about disease resistance. They'll tell you about vigor. They'll tell you sometimes that this rootstock is better for larger fruited tomatoes or smaller fruited tomatoes, or better for determinate or indeterminate tomatoes, better for greenhouse, better for field. <clears throat> so it's important to look at that. For watermelon, usually the rootstock is a hybrid squash. Um, there are some new rootstocks coming on the market. Uh, there's one that I've worked with previously that I believe is actually out there now that is a wild watermelon. Uh, you can also graft on bottle gourd, uh, a little less common, but most of the time we are grafting on a hybrid squash. Uh, so one example of that, again, this is with Johnny's, is this variety called Tetsuka Buto. Um, what is funny is that if you look, if you can see this, uh, this is under vegetable squash and winter squash. So Tetsuka Buto is a winter squash and they're promoting it as a winter squash. They actually don't even mention it being used as a rootstock. If you look right down here, you see that it's a hybrid between Cucurbita maxima and Cucurbita machata. So most of the rootstocks are uh, of this hybrid parentage, but there are different varieties. So Tetsuka Buto is one example. Um, and all of these give disease resistance and increased vigor. <clears throat> so how do you choose the scion? Well, the scion is chosen based on the uh, fruiting characteristics that you want. Um, so this is like if you were going to plant watermelons or tomatoes, this is the variety you would normally buy. Uh, so think of this, if, uh, a good example on watermelon would be crimson sweet, the old standby seeded watermelon. Um, for tomatoes, this could be anything. Do you want a cherry? Do you want a plum? Do you want a paste tomato? Do you want a slicing tomato? You know, whatever it happens to be, really doesn't matter. You choose the scion variety. <clears throat> for tomatoes, uh, you may be familiar with determinant versus indeterminate. If you're not, you can read more about it on like Johnny's website, or you can just Google that. Uh, grafting works very well for indeterminate tomatoes that produce over a long period of time. Um, it works also for determinate varieties. Determinate varieties just grow to more or less a set height and they produce over a shorter period of time. When it comes to watermelon, uh, you do need to pay attention to uh, the seeded or seedless. And this is not specific to grafting, but if you plant a seedless or triploid watermelon, you do need a seeded variety or diploid variety uh, as a pollinizer or you won't get good fruit set. So, if you happen to graft a seedless variety, you need to also plant a seeded variety as a pollinizer. All right, so then we need to start the scion and the rootstock from seed. Uh, so we start out with seed propagation. Uh, we would follow normal seed propagation or starting requirements. So uh, we use some sort of germination media, typically a more fine textured media. Uh, we want to use clean containers. We like warm temperatures, providing bottom heat, if at all possible. So like heat mats would be helpful. Uh, we like high light. Now understanding that we can germinate both watermelon and tomato in the dark, uh, but as soon as those plants are about to emerge, it's very important that they're in light. Uh, we want high light, helps produce higher quality seedlings, uh, limit stretch. Uh, it's just, it's better overall for the plants. So uh, high light is important. Um, if you, maybe you've looked at germination percentage before, uh, Johnny's prints it on their packages. Um, just understand basically that every seed you sow doesn't germinate, <clears throat> but further than that, every seed you sow 
that germinates is not going to grow into a normal plant that is usable for grafting. So we graft on a certain day. <clears throat> We're trying to match up the scion in the rootstock. And so if, for example, we have germination spread over a week long period, the later germinating seedlings are going to be delayed compared to the earlier germinating seedlings. So <clears throat> it's helpful sometimes to just do a quick test uh, before you actually sow for grafting, to plant a few seeds, see how they germinate, see how the germination is spread out, see if you have a high percentage of kind of misformed seedlings so that you can make sure you sow enough seeds. When it comes to the rootstock and scion, um, <clears throat> there are differences between these different varieties. Uh, so for tomato, the scion and rootstock need to be similar in diameter for grafting. This is important. And generally, we would sow those at the same time. Now, <clears throat> this is a point. So I'm, I'm alerting you to the fact this is personal preference. Uh, you can read all kinds of things on the Internet that will tell you you have to sow the rootstock a week before, two weeks before, uh, a week later, you know, whatever. The point is, understand this, that we need the scion rootstock and excuse me, the scion and rootstock stem diameter or hypocotyl diameter need to be similar. We need those to be as close as possible to each other when we're grafting. So this is where it's helpful if you test your seeds. If you just look and see how do they germinate, how do they grow, some of these are more vigorous than others. Uh, but generally sowing at the same time is helpful. Um, <clears throat> for watermelon, the scion and rootstock diameter never match. So we're not trying to match that up. Uh, so generally for watermelon, we sow the scion before the rootstock. So <clears throat> the scion is going to be the watermelon. The rootstock is going to be this hybrid squash or hybrid pumpkin. And the uh, squash grows much faster than the watermelon. So we're gonna generally sow the watermelon uh, before the pumpkin. One thing is already mentioned, testing ahead of time. Uh, and then adjusting your sowing for grafting. The other option is just to sow over a few days. So don't sow all of your seed at one time. For example, <clears throat> if you want to graft, if your plan is to, to graft you know, 25 tomatoes, uh, then you would need at least 25 scion seeds and at least 25 rootstock seeds. Um, I would suggest you sow 30 or 35 or even as many as 50 seeds if you don't have any knowledge of how that seed's going to perform. And you might want to sow for example, 50 seeds and sow 10 seeds each day for five days. <clears throat> so you have scion and rootstock spread over a several day period. So it gives you more flexibility when it comes to the point of grafting to have them be the right diameter. <clears throat> you can also manage and adjust growth after germination. So if you see, for example, that one of the varieties is growing faster than the other, then we can, <clears throat> we can give more fertilizer to the slower growing variety. Uh, we could put it in a warm environment, something like that, to speed it up. <clears throat> Excuse me, I apologize for clearing my throat in, in your ear. Okay, so examples of um, poor germination or poor stand establishment or a low usable percentage. Every cell had a seed in it, <clears throat> and you see we have a lot of empty cells, and there's a good bit of variation in size. You see a very small seedling here. A much larger seedling here. So this is one reason we could sow some seed ahead of time or we sow seed over several days because it doesn't always work out well. Uh, this is an example of a pretty uniform stand of seedlings, uh, much nicer. Uh, this was in the greenhouse where I was working in Asheville. I mean, this was two, and this was a seed test of a new, uh, of a new uh, seed lot we had not tried before, but this is what we were striving for. So we want uniformity as much as possible. Okay, so when do we graft? I already said you need to sow your scion and rootstock uh, so that we can have them ready at the appropriate time for grafting. So when do we graft? We talk about tomatoes. Uh, we want to graft when the tomatoes have um, approximately two to four true leaves. So this is not counting the cotyledons. If we look at this picture, so this upper picture is of tomatoes. This happens to be tomato rootstock, but it doesn't matter. So you see the two cotyledons or the preformed seed leaves right there. And then we have approximately two true leaves above that. Uh, if we were able to see a little closer, that third leaf is starting to develop, but this is a good stage for grafting. <clears throat> a little bigger than this is okay, but we don't want a large plant. 
you know, we don't want a bunch of leaves. We don't really want really mature leaves. Uh, we prefer seedlings that are not stretched, uh, that are not weak, that are not spindly. <clears throat> we also don't want them overly mature. So what this looks like for tomato, this is very general, is around 18 to 23 days after sowing for both the scion and rootstock. I can tell you that for grafting in our plant propagation lab, um, I have planned for 20 days from sowing until grafting. Um, so 18 to 23 days. For watermelon, uh, watermelon, this is watermelon scion down here. We want to graft when we have that first true leaf developed, but ideally before we see the second leaf developing. So like this bottom plant where that first leaf is still very tight, these are your cotyledons. Uh, this, this is okay, but we'd like it a little bigger, like that size, but we don't want two or three leaves present. For the rootstock, uh, we really should not see the true leaves or the first leaf should just be starting. So this is the hybrid squash rootstock. You see cotyledons and we don't see that first leaf developing. So this is a good stage up until about this point on the rootstock. Uh, beyond that, it's getting too mature. Again, we don't want these plants to be stretched. For the scion, we're looking at around 13 to 21 days after sowing. I know that's a, that's a long range there. Uh, what I can tell you is for the seeded varieties, which most likely will be grafting, uh, we would have fewer days. So 13 to 17 days, perhaps, for the seeded varieties. If you want to graft seedless, it's going to be longer, more in the range of this 21 days. For the rootstock, again, grows much faster. So we're looking around nine to 13 days. Uh, so for example, if we're uh, figuring on 15, 16 days for our scion, we probably want to figure on about nine or 10 days for our rootstock. <clears throat> All right, so, wow, there's so much to say and I feel like I'm running out of time. So I will try to move through this. And again, there is the video at the end where you can watch this and I talk you through the steps. So we're not able to cover everything. Uh, the resources are still there for you. Uh, for supplies, we need crafting clips. Um, we have tube style clips. Well, this is kind of a combination between the tube style and tweezer style, uh, but it's more of a tube style. This is more of a tweezer style clip. Uh, silicone is good. It's better than plastic because it's flexible. Uh, there's a lot of different sizes. It's helpful if you have a few different sizes because you don't know exactly the size that your rootstock and scion will be. As you'll see in the video, um, I only had one size of grafting clips when I was grafting my tomatoes and they were a little bigger than I would have preferred. The, <clears throat> the sign and rootstock were a little bigger, so the clip didn't fit as well as it should have. Uh, so having a few different sizes is helpful. Uh, we need a sharp blade. Um, these barber style razor blades are very helpful. They're better than the utility style. So in my video, uh, I was ill-prepared and I'm using the utility style razor blade, you know, like kind of a scraper blade where um, it's, it's just a straight edge and it's more rigid. That's not the best. You can see I have a little trouble making the smooth cuts. So this style of blade is better. Um, there are also grafting tools. So I actually purchased a few of these from Johnny's. It's a Japanese made tool. Um, I've not used these before. So in two weeks when we graft in our lab, we're gonna give these a shot. Uh, I don't know if you can see this on the tool, but there's little grooves right here in the jaw where you line up the stem. So it helps you to make uh, the proper angled cut. Um, in addition, we need uh, a mist or a spray bottle, and we'll explain why in just a minute. So we want to graft in an area that's been cleaned, uh, ideally disinfected, not like a dirty potting bench or something like that. Um, you might want to graft up your kitchen table or just an area where you've cleaned off. Um, you can put down some plastic or something over a dirty surface, but ideally using a clean surface. We don't want to graft in direct sunlight. So don't, if you have like a small greenhouse, don't graft in the greenhouse, don't graft outside, don't graft right in front of the sunny window. Um, we want to have indirect light. We don't want to stress the plants during grafting. We don't want a lot of air moving around. So no ceiling fans, no like strong airflow going through the environment. Uh, those would, that would cause the grafts to dry out before uh, we have them fully grafted. Uh, not too hot, not too cold, not too dry. So kind of like Goldilocks, right? We want it just right. Okay, so there's different methods for grafting when it comes to solanaceous plants. I'm not gonna go through the, each of these. Uh, we're gonna use the splice graft. This is what I recommend. Uh, this is personal preference. <clears throat> there's other ways to do it. So I'm not telling you that these are wrong, uh, but the splice graft method is what I will demonstrate. Okay, for splice grafting tomatoes, 
Uh, this is the most common method used for all Solanaceous species, not just tomatoes. Uh, for this one, it is important that we have a similarly sized cyanide rootstock. We need to match these diameters up as well as we can. If they don't match perfectly, we can increase the angle of the cup to give more surface area to help heal that graft. Okay, so for spice grafting, we are, it's very simple. We're making approximately a 45, ang 45 degree angled cut. Uh, we can go steeper, so it can be more like, you know, if this is 45, it can be 60 or 70 degrees. Um, but on the rootstock, we're cutting below the cotyledons, all right? So if we look uh, right here, these are the cotyledons. These are the first two seed leaves, and we're cutting below that. Again, you can see on this tray, uh, we had some rootstocks here. There's the cotyledons. The cotyledons would have been here, and they've cut right below that. So we cut below the cotyledons. We place the grafting clip um, halfway onto the graft, so it's like halfway on, halfway off. And we want to orient the clip so that the graft runs diagonal to the opening. I'll show you this in just a second. Okay, then for the scion, we are making the same angled cut that we made on the rootstock. Um, for the scion, we can cut above or below the cotyledons. Um, for home grafting, it really doesn't matter. I typically cut above the cotyledons, but um, it's kind of personal preference on that. Uh, we want to choose a scion that has about two to three leaves. It's best if they're not fully developed large leaves. And again, we want to try to match stem diameter with the rootstock. So if we're looking at our scion tray, uh, you probably have some variations. Some are thicker than others. So you want to sort of pick through that and try to choose scions that match the diameter of the rootstock. Okay, I think you can see maybe a little better here. So that angle is running this way. There's the opening of the clip, and we're inserting the scion down in to match those cut surfaces together. Uh, so you may have to play around a little bit with the clip. You may have to lift it up a little bit, kind of twist the scion or rootstock to get them to line up properly. Uh, but you can see in this picture, the rootstock on the bottom with more purple coloration and the scion on the top with more green coloration and a, a pretty well aligned graft. Like this is okay that this doesn't totally align right there. The plants will heal, uh, but it's important that we have sufficient contact. If we don't push it all the way down and we have like an airspace between there, then the, the graft union dries out. So we need to make sure they're in contact. And it may be helpful to support the grafted plant with some sort of stick. Uh, if we look at this bottom picture, you can see the rootstock is thin compared to the scion. So this is not a good match. And you see how weak it is. The plants are sort of leaning over. So we want to try to do a better job of matching up scion and rootstock diameter. <clears throat> All right, let me talk about watermelon grafting and then we'll talk about healing. Okay, so for watermelon grafting, there's also multiple ways to do this. Uh, this is hole insertion. This is side grafting. This is approach grafting. This is, is, is more or less splice grafting, but it's kind of modified. It's uh, called single cotyledon grafting, and there's even double grafting. So uh, we're using the single cotyledon method, and this is most common for cucurbit species. Uh, in this case, the, the rootstock and scion diameter never match. That sort of shows that in these diagrams that the watermelon is always a little smaller than the squash, and that's totally fine. It's very important, though, in watermelon grafting that we're precise, and I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. Uh, we need to be precise in our cut on the rootstock so that we don't get rootstock regrowth. So with the rootstock, um, I, I want to just highlight this. We have options. We can remove the roots of the rootstock and reroot it, or we can graft onto the rootstock like we did with tomatoes and leave those roots in place. Uh, either of these is okay. Um, my experience is more with cutting the rootstock off of the roots. So you see, here is the rootstock. We were, we've cut the root system off. We would make the graft, and then we would stick that as a grafted cutting. And we're healing the graft and rooting at the same time. Uh, there's, there's reasons to do either of these that I think are beyond what I have time to explain right now. But what we're doing is we're making a cut right here between the two cotyledons. You can see the result. We've removed one cotyledon. We've removed the apical meristem or the growing point. You can see that also in, in this upper right-hand picture. Uh, but we want to 
to make a smooth cut, we want to remove the cotyledon and the growing point, and we want to make sure we've gotten all of that meristem uh, out of there, the growing tissue right there at that growing point so that we don't get the rootstock regrowing. Uh, again, I talk more about this in the video if you, if you want to watch that. So don't cut too deep into the petiole of the cotyledon here or here, uh, but if you don't cut deep enough, you don't get all of the rootstock meristem out. For the scion, uh, we're cutting the scion below the cotyledons. We're making um, a similarly angled cut. So again, 45 to 60, 70 degrees, something in that range. Uh, we want to cut the scion about half an inch to an inch below the cotyledons. Uh, I showed this in the video, but if you look at the, the hypocondyl or the stem of the scion, it's oval shaped. So you want to make a cut across the wider section. And again, don't worry about trying to match up the diameter with the rootstock because it won't. Then we just align those cut surfaces. So we line them up. We place a clip on there to hold them in place. We want to make sure that we have good contact between there. We want to see the, uh, that angled cut in the opening of the clip. And if you cut the rootstock off its roots, like what I'm showing here, then we restick that. We stick it into a new tray and we support the graft of the stick if needed. If you left the rootstock on its roots, no problem, then all we're doing is healing that graft. And now we need, a, we need some sort of healing environment. So when I say healing, we've just done plant surgery. Now we need to heal those. All right, so we have two, two plant tissues that are uh, stuck together, but they're not joined yet. So during the healing process, we're forming new vascular cambium. We're getting the, uh, the wound to heal between the two plants to make a proper connection between those two tissues. So the first 48 hours are critical to graft success. We don't want the plants to wilt. We don't want to stress them out. Uh, so it's helpful to, to, as you're grafting, to mist those plants to keep them from wilting excessively. And then a healing environment is just an environment that is humid. Um, that is warm and that has low light. So we're talking like 85 to 100% relative humidity. We're talking 75 to 85 degrees and low light. <clears throat> After about five days, we begin to lower the humidity. And I'll show you how we can do that in a minute. And in about a week, six to 10 days, uh, we're ready for normal conditions. Okay, so for healing chambers, uh, I worked in very sophisticated. We had insulated rooms inside a building with grow lights. They were climate controlled. I mean, everything was completely controlled. Uh, very, very high tech. Uh, there's other ways to do this, kind of building a healing chamber with a humidifier. Uh, but you can also just use these little mini greenhouses that you can use for rooting cuttings, that you can use for um, germinating seeds, really. Uh, we can use heat mats, things like that, to keep the temperature up. We can use tents. So if you happen to have a greenhouse or uh, like a sunroom or something, you're just creating uh, an enclosed environment where we're limiting light, we're keeping humidity up, and we're keeping a warm temperature. So think cuttings rather than seeds. So if you've rooted cuttings at home, think about that environment for healing the graft rather than seeds. Seeds, we need a high light. For healing, we need low light. Okay, so as I mentioned, we start to lower the humidity. We start to increase the light. Um, if the media is drying out, we water the plants. That's okay. Uh, so after about a week, usually the graft is healed. Uh, so now we need to harden the plants off or acclimate them before they can be planted out in the garden. So we need to increase light. Uh, we need to decrease temperature. We need to stress those plants a little bit so that they're uh, more used to outdoor conditions. Uh, grafting clips, we can just let the grafting clips fall off. Some people want to take them off and that's okay. You just don't want to take it off too early because that graft still uh, sometimes needs that support in the early stages. Uh, we want to look for adventitious rooting above the graft. So here's a tomato, there's the rootstock, there's the scion, and you see these roots coming out. Uh, that's okay, that happens sometimes in healing, but what's important is that these tips dry out and these roots don't make it down to the soil. We also want to look for and remove rootstock regrowth. And I'll show you that. So I'm wrapping up, just have a few more slides here. Uh, so examples of things that happen with tomatoes, we get a lot of rooting sometimes, root formation from the scion. This is pretty excessive. 
uh, but it's okay as long as these roots don't make it down to the media. So here on the right hand picture, we see where the tomato scion is rooted down into the media. So if we don't cut these roots off, these roots bypass the graft. And if there's soil borne disease, when we plant our plant in the garden, then that disease comes into the plant and it goes straight through these roots into the scion and it will kill the scion. <clears throat> so we wanna make sure when we plant our grafts that we're planting at the same level that they were previously. So in this case, we ignore the usual advice for tomatoes and watermelons of planting deep. Uh, so normally if I'm planting a non-grafted tomato, I dig a pretty deep hole and I bury that stem because it will root out along the stem. Same thing with the watermelon. But we need to make sure that we're keeping that grafted uh, union above the soil level. Otherwise, the scion roots into the soil. We want to look for uh, rootstock regrowth. So uh, this is grafted watermelon. And I'll show a couple more pictures, but that's the squash. So in this case, the scion died. It was an unsuccessful graft and the rootstock uh, began to regrow. So we want to look for uh, leaves that don't look like a watermelon and we want to remove that, or in this case, that's just a failed graft. So watermelon grafts, um, here is the rootstock. There's the single cotyledon and the stem or the hypocotyl. And then here is the watermelon scion and there is regrowth beginning from the squash. So you see it coming out right there where we didn't fully remove that meristem. This is more developed. Uh, you see again, the squash coming out and here it's even more developed. The squash grows faster than the watermelon. So if we don't remove this, it will overtake the watermelon when we plant it out in the garden. We can also have rootstock regrowth on tomatoes. So in this case, there's the rootstock, there's the graft union. This is the scion. Now this is a pinched tomato, so we cut the top out and we have multiple shoots coming out, but these are coming from the scion. If we look again, graft union rootstock, this is rootstock regrowth. So this is coming from the rootstock. We need to cut that off because this is, will grow faster than the scion, and this will produce small tomatoes that are no good. Think crab apple versus apple, uh, but if you like crab apples, this is a bad crab apple, okay? So like rootstock regrowth is not good. We want to remove this. Okay, so that is it. That is all I have for the presentation. I appreciate you guys joining. I know it was a lot of information. Um, so I have this video um, that I think Kathleen will be able to share. Maybe she can email it out or something like that, or I think she'll share the presentation. You can click the link. Uh, this is unlisted on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and search vegetable crafting, you're not gonna find my video. You can only access it through this link. And this is about 21 minutes long and I demonstrate both watermelon and tomato grafting and talk through some of those points as I go. So thank you for, um, for listening and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful and informative presentation. I feel like I have walked away with a lot of new tools and um, I'm excited to try vegetable graphing of my own. Um, we haven't had any questions in the chat box at this time. I think everyone has been very intently listening. Um, so we do have about five minutes left in today's session. So if anybody would like to um, type questions into the chat box, please do so now. All right, we just had one question. Um, could you explain why you cut off um, the roots that are coming from the scion? Um, it says it seems like that might be extra weakening of the plant. Okay, so I think you're, are you talking about on the um, water? I think we're talking about watermelon grafting when I mentioned that you have two options for the rootstock. You can either cut the rootstock off its roots and reroot it, or you can leave it on its roots. Um, the reason commercially that we cut it off its roots is, um, Yes, uh, the reason commercially that we did this is because what happens in that healing environment, remember I said warm, humid, low light. Um, anybody, I think if you've grown any seedlings at all, you would know those are conditions that lead to stretch. Uh, so this rootstock is really vigorous. It's a squash, it wants to grow fast. So if we put the rootstock into that healing environment, with its roots in place, it's still taking up water, it's still taking up nutrients. And what tends to happen is that rootstock stretches during healing. Uh, so 
commercially, this is a big problem because no grower, no farmer, uh, no greenhouse operator says, I want stretched seedlings. They want compact seedlings. If you go back to, stop sharing, but I'll go back and show my, uh, back to this um, screen. So if we look at these pictures, like this is a watermelon, grafted watermelon transplant ready to go. This is ready to ship out. Um, very compact. This is not a stretched plant. So uh, what tends to happen is if we don't cut this rootstock off its roots during healing, this hypocotyl, this stem stretches. And so whereas this point is about an inch and a half above the media, uh, we could end up with you know, five or six inches. Um, so commercially, it's, it's kind of frowned upon because uh, nobody wants those tall transplants. It, it makes transportation difficult. We get fewer plants on the truck. It's a big problem. As a home gardener, it's not such a big deal. Um, if you have a, a stretched rootstock, not really a big deal. You could actually then, when you plant the garden, you could bury part of that rootstock because the, the idea is that you just want to keep that graft union out of the soil. Uh, so the, the one other reason beyond the stretching is because that rootstock is so vigorous, if we don't cut it off its roots, it is continuing to take up water. So you have root pressure, all right? The plant's taking up water and it's pushing that up through the stem and it can actually push the scion off. So I've seen graphs where it's pushed the scion off and, and either the scion dies or we get misalignment and it's not healed properly. Uh, so you can definitely leave the roots, but there's just some issues that come with that. It really, if you have the right conditions for healing, uh, the fact that you're rerooting it is no big deal. You don't need rooting hormone. It'll work just fine. Great. Thank you. We've had a couple um, requests for the YouTube link. Would you be able to copy paste that into the chat box for participants so they have that directly? Sure can. Let me see if I can. Thanks. I'm not the most technologically savvy person, but we'll see if I can figure this out. I'll try to take uh, questions while I'm doing this. Go ahead. Um, okay. When would you fertilize grafted tomatoes? Here we go. Sorry. I think I said I thought I could do this. Uh, I'll give you a minute. Yeah, it should be, should be in chat now. Okay. There it is. When would you fertilize grafted tomatoes? Um, so, you know, when you're when you're producing your cyan and rootstock, whether it's uh, for watermelon or tomato, uh, you can fertilize the seedlings as they're growing. You know, like you normally would with seedlings, with a generally a lower level of fertilization. You don't want to get too much, especially too much nitrogen pushes really fast growth. So you don't want to do that. Um, but whether or not you fertilize the cyan or rootstock. Uh, immediately after they come out of healing, you can begin fertilizing. That's totally fine. Um, yeah, and you don't have to cut the strength or anything. So once that graft is healed, it's healed, and that plant is ready to go. Like it's the rootstock is ready to rock. I mean, it's wanting to push growth. So you can fertilize uh, immediately like you normally would. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about his like historical grafting. So what was used to be used when grafting before grafting clips were invented since grafting has been along, around for such a long time? Yeah, so um, that's actually a good point. And I kind of forgot, I sort of glossed over this. Again, there's like so much to cover and I, you know, I could talk forever about grafting. I love talking about grafting. Um, so when historically grafting was uh, woody plants. So when we graft fruit trees, we graft grapevines, things like that, like that's woody tissue. Uh, those are old plants. Those are things that are you know, years old. Uh, you can graft in an orchard. You can come in and graft or bud onto existing trees that are decades old. Um, and so in that case, they're using like a grafting wax uh, or uh, like a rubber band basically that's been cut. And so it's just like a grafting rubber. It's like a strip of rubber and you can wrap it around the graft and kind of tie it off. That's an option. You can use like plastic wrap, things like that to wrap it. Um, so I would, I would say like probably early on in vegetable grafting, I imagine they sort of did a lot of the same things. But with vegetable grafting, we're dealing with very young plants um, this is very soft tissue. So, you know, fruit tree grafting is woody tissue. Um, vegetable grafting is very young, soft tissue. So we want to be careful with it. If we squeeze it too much, if we put too much pressure, 
is we try to paint the wax on, you know, the, the wax is hot or warm for it to be melted. And if we put that onto like soft tissue, we're likely to burn it. Uh, so yeah, I would imagine early on though, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, vegetable grafting probably used some of the same methods they used in woody grafting. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was, oh, it looks like the YouTube link did not work. So what I'll do is I'll move this to the um, webinar archive. I'll make sure to include that YouTube link underneath um, the okay. link of the recording. So I can pull that from um, from the presentation and have it there. So do keep an eye on that um, in the coming days. We will make sure we get that up um, as soon as we can. Uh, but we are right at 11. So thank you so much for joining us. This has been a really interesting presentation. There's been a lot of um, comments in the chat box about how much people enjoyed and found it interesting. So we really appreciate you joining us here this morning. Yeah, I just pasted, uh, I don't, yeah, that link actually doesn't look right. I don't know why, uh, what happened, it cut off the first part. So I just pasted the link back in. So if somebody wants to give that a shot real quick, that new link should work. Uh, it looks like it, it just cut off part of the end. So it's there in the chat. thank you. Certainly. Yes, it does look like that one should work. So okay, awesome. Yeah. Right. Thank you All guys. Right. Thank you everyone. Great day.